702 Masterclass. The Masterclass with Rele Bokhila and Maboja on 702 is brought to you by ABSA Home Loans. T's and C's apply. ABSA is an authorized financial services and registered credit provider, NCR CP7. So we're going to be talking about uh, property every first and last Wednesday of the month. 702 and ABSA Home Loans will walk the home ownership journey with South Africans by providing expert guidance and practical tools, empowering you to make informed decisions and reducing anxiety associated with significant financial commitments such as home ownership. Today we're speaking to Daniel Kazadi, Director at the South African Property Investor Network, who is here to discuss property investment regarding of where one finds themselves in the property journey. A very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Jane. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, our listeners will be a lot happier after speaking to you. It's an emotional journey, this getting onto the, the property ladder. Um, uh, my one, if you allow me, I used to live in London and I, I spotted a place in Old Street and um, it was not a very funky area at all. Um, you know, the tube stations, there were people there, um, you know, horrible picture, but sitting there with injections in their arms, sort of vomit on the steps, Jeez. that kind of vibe. Anyway, I got this, I got this loft and I got it cheap as chips and I did it up and then I sold it and I doubled my money which wasn't much then today at that same tube station you know there are people walking around with their yoga mats and uh, there are all these organic shops nice, <laughs> nice. and if I'd held on to that property well it would be a different story it's such an emotional journey isn't it whether you buy whether you sell when to when to buy when to sell it's a tricky one no it is quite tricky hey um that's that's a common thing as well, hey? When do you buy? When do you sell? Is it the right time to buy or should you be renting at this point in time? I think a lot of people are faced with that dilemma and what what just happened to, believe me when I say, happens to so many people. I remember a story. Um, one of my students actually bought a property in um, Ferndale yeah. and then just sold it. And a few months after, um, the plans were released by town planning that how train was extending their route so they're connecting Lanceria to or tambo and ferndale was one of the areas they they spotted where the how train station would be and for those people that um where were around when how train first came in property prices appreciated by 40 percent mm. so he lost out oh. on that so that was quite <laughs> that is not fun at all and every time you sit on that train or uh. you go past there i mean i i mean i i must have sold this about 20 years ago and i still i, I I it feel, haunts you to know. I keep thinking, oh, I could have made this and then I could be, you know, it's, oh. it's, like, it's like winning the lottery. I would love to know from our listeners what sort of experience they have when it comes to buying property. Is it intimidating? Is it something that you that you want to do? I mean, how do you get on to that ladder? How challenging is it? We've got the man who can provide you with all of those answers. Uh, you can call us on 011 883 0702. You can tweet us at Radio 702 using the hashtag 702 Afternoons. You can also WhatsApp me on 072 702 1702. What do you see? What is the most common question or the most common fear when somebody walks in? Um, the most common fear I'd say people have when looking to buy the investment property is the great unknown. Hey? Um, they're buying this property, they, they don't understand what are some of the costs, implications that come with it. I mean, they, they put in an offer and then two sets of attorneys provide two invoices on fees that, that are due and people do not see those coming. I would say those are that's one of the biggest one and they buy a property shame with no knowledge on what they're going to do. They don't understand the market because yes, um, like you put it, there's a lot of emotional attachment that comes with property. Mm. But what people don't quite understand is it's a lot of financial burden that comes with it. And um, they do not understand the overall cost that comes with acquiring an asset after it's now your property. Um, small things like changing the rates account from the old owner to your, your, to your name, um, the admin that comes with it is quite, is quite intimidating. I'd say those are the big things I'd say people don't see coming, huh? Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm not an admin person and all of those kind of things. I mean, they just, your, your, your body just fries with the boredom of it, right? <laughs> all, the, all the sort of transfers, the paperwork that's got to be done. Is there some, I mean, can 
can somebody go to you and say, listen, you know, what, what are the hidden costs? What do I need to put aside? How long is it going to take? I need to know all of that before I get involved. No, definitely. I think together with Absa Bank, we are now making a commitment committed effort to under, to ensure people understand what are the costs of entry, we call it, when acquiring a property. Um, so online, you can find different calculators like I know Uber, um, so OOBA, not the e-hailing company <laughs> Uber, um, OOBA, there's something called transfer costs calculate, calculator. So you insert the purchase price of the property, you insert um, the, the deposit you're going to put into the property, and then it works out for you what your transfer costs are, what is the estimated cost that a bond registration attorney is going to be charging you because if you are getting a bond just be be cautious that the bank normally elects someone um, to do the the bond registration on their behalf that you are liable to pay for the conveyancer so as soon as you put in an offer just ask the state agent can i speak to your conveyancer and just get the how much they're going to charge me for all their fees for the transfer duty. And what people do not know is all of these costs are negotiable. Um, mm -hmm. So you can negotiate with both sets of attorneys and I highly recommend that you do that as well. Okay, so I mean, you you are responsible for for property investment. I yes. mean, it sounds quite simple, simple property investment, but I know it's not. Tell us a little bit more about it and, and how you got into it and what works for you. Yeah, definitely. So I'm 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 from the SA Property Investors Network, uh, known as SAPIN, which is a network of like-minded um, property investors. And what we call investors are people going out there to acquire properties, not to live in necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to be renting it out. They're going to be developing, doing Airbnb, doing student accommodations or multi-lets. Um, what we do is we educate in individuals. How do you run a profitable business, but also go and scale? How are you going to be financing it? How do you do your due diligence before even acquiring this property how do you give yourself a full idea on what you're getting yourself into um so how i started on that journey geez um call it eight years ago uh -huh. i read a book called rich dad poor dad not sure if you're familiar with that book uh yeah. written by robert kiyosaki so it's a man that grew up with two parents a rich dad and a poor dad and he talks about the different mindsets of the two dads that he he was fortunate enough to grow up with and um, how his rich dad would, would always preach to him, you need to acquire assets and cash flowing assets, things that put money into your pocket. After reading that book, um, I was quite young um, before my matric. It was then, oh no, after my matric, it was then I decided, geez, yes, I still wanted to go to university. I went through UJ, got, got my degree in accounting. Um, but I also wanted to then start buying assets. And I attended a couple of seminars. I later met, met a man that became my coach and my mentor, who's our CEO at Sapin, so Anzu Walker. Anzu took me under his wing. Um, I, I then started shadowing Anzu. To, um, seeing how he puts deals together, how he'd buy blocks of flats and everything he would do, I'd just practice. And then I'd come back to him, hey, Andrew, look, there's this person <laughs> that wants to sell their property. What do I do? So he then guided me through that entire journey. So that's how I, I later found myself in the investment space. God, isn't it wonderful when you find out? I mean, when I left school, I had no idea what I was going to do. I ended up working in the SABC office and then suddenly thinking, wow. I really like this, you know, Jeez. running and teaching yourself how to do things. So it's wonderful when you find your calling, right? And I should imagine for someone like you, helping people get on the ladder and, and make money, that must be quite a buzz. No, oh, su such an amazing feeling, hey? Um, particularly for young individuals. Mm. Um, so being a, a, a youngster, call it a youth myself, um, I take particular joy in seeing other youngsters um, take the course of their financial journeys in their own hands. And um, s like a, a number of stories come to mind where young individuals are acquiring their first investment property as opposed to buying their own primary residence and doing Airbnb, doing a development. Um, one of my students in Taki, actually, um, super proud of, of the young man. He came to, to join Sapin. Um, mm -hmm. He was about 19 years old to the point now. Um, he's got two properties in the township. So he's doing township sort of um, providing accommodation in township. He's got a multi-let with about eight units um, mm -hmm. and it's paying for itself. Right? So um, through the teachings, he understands how to run your due diligence and the income he obtains pays for all of his expenses and puts money oh. into his business. Um, and just to see the growth of such a young man, um, and seeing the effect on his family 
um, is so beautiful, eh? so beautiful to see. I can imagine. Let's listen to this voice note from Michelle. Good day, Jane. The biggest problem facing homeowners now is they might only be able to buy a flat or sectional title or something to that effect. But people don't understand what they're buying into. They don't understand that there are rules and regulations. They also don't understand the importance of levies because that is what covers the general maintenance of the complex and to cover the servicing bills. So these are things that people who are chairpersons like myself, we have endless hassles with people. And at the end of the day, if you take it up to 60% of all schemes in South Africa are in trouble because you have a couple of people not paying and it can actually take your whole scheme down and devalue your scheme. So this is something that needs to be addressed in South Africa because it's a ticking time bomb. What's your response to that message from Michelle? Thanks, Michelle. No, thanks, Michelle. A hundred percent. So people don't understand when you're buying into a body corporate or a sectional title, you need to understand that um, property is a long-term game. And amongst a lot of things that people do wrong is they, they number one, buy into a sectional title that they do not vet properly. You need to understand that if you've got a high default, like Michelle said, um, if you've got a high default of people not paying levies, it just devalues things where the body corporates, the individuals, the trustees that are running this this complex do not have enough funds to get stuff done and pay for things and they have to ra- raise um, special levies. And by raising special levies, it just makes the, that entire body corporate unattractive to new buyers. So mm-hmm. let's say you want to sell the property now and someone wants to buy the property, it increases the, the monthly expenses they have to pay. So they first have to pay the bond, they have to pay normal levies, and now there's an introduction of special levies as well that you need to cater for. I, I definitely think um, do not buy into a body corporate without vetting, number one, the financial statements of that body corporate. Assess the, the rules set out by the body corporate and the trustees. Mm-hmm. Understand what, what is the vision of the body corporate you are looking to buy into. Does it speak to what you're trying to accomplish and understand how they each and every single body corporate has something called a 10 year maintenance plan. I bought a property once um, in in the northwest. I'll not name the, 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 the complex, but before acquiring the property, we got one of our inspector, Marisha Robas, to go have a look. And she saw that majority of these properties weren't built to NHBRC building standards and that body corporate were not following the 10-year maintenance plan. What we then saw is just an absolute crazy level of depreciation on the the physical assets themselves, the damp not being taken care of. Mm. So you need to understand that if you are buying intersectional title, there's more to it than meets the eye. And it's not just like a free 100%. You need to make sure you cross all your T's and dot your I's from the financials of the body corporate. Are they constantly raising loans to get things done? Um, How are they taking care of every single thing that comes with it? Because you can be paying your levies, but if your neighbors in paying their the levies, then mm. it impacts you, huh? Right, absolutely. Do your research. Do your research. Uh, there's a, a question here from Hitani. How do I negotiate the transfer attorney fee? And under what ground should I negotiate for better fee than what they have initially invoiced? No, 100%. So I think it always helps if you just ask. Eh? I, I normally just try to go for a 30% discount. Um, and provided you've got the call it the relationship. It's very difficult, but what most home buyers do not know is when acquiring a property, you can actually request from the the state agents and the owner, you can negotiate and just ask if you can use your attorneys, provided you've got the relationship with the said attorneys, you've acquired a couple of properties, you Mm. can actually request it. And if you give back work to these individuals, they can give you up to 50% off. I know for first time home buyers, um, do not quote me on that. Um, They they normally get about 50% off any bond attorney fees when they do acquire properties. Mm. So, Definitely check that and nothing nothing stops you from just requesting it, huh? Absolutely. And it's amazing how often that holds you back, right? I mean, I've uh, renegotiated uh, mortgage rates in the past and you ask and they go, well, 
mm, and reluctantly will will do something about it. So you have to ask. There's another question here from Jibril. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. I would like to ask your guests what is uh, the best option, adding an initial deposit or adding payment more money years later? I'm asking because the initial deposit can be... Hold on, you've gone off there. Well, the, the initial deposit can be a lot of money. No, definitely. I think... Number one, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, what, what are you t- trying to achieve by doing that? By adding a bigger deposit, what, what in, in turn you're doing is you're lowering the, the monthly bond repayments that you, you'd be um, incurring. And that is advisable, especially when, when entering any investment. I think it's very key and important. I think you asked the question earlier, mm. some of the mistakes we see individuals acquiring properties without having an exit strategy at the back of their minds. So yes, it is always good to be optimistic and um, know if you're going to do Airbnb and think of the best case scenario. But what we advise individuals is enter each investment to having at the back of your mind, what happens Mm. should this not go to plan? What putting a deposit allows you to do is most or average investors will buy properties for market value. I'll give you an example. Let's say there's a property, you see the market value is a million rand. By putting a hundred thousand rand deposit, what what that allows you to do is um, you're getting a bond for 900,000 rand. Mm. And if you want to sell, you know that you're at least going to break even Mm. and you're not overly leveraged on one asset. So that's the pro of, say, putting in a deposit. Number one, it kind of safeguards your, your exit. And number two is your monthly bond is reduced. By paying extra, what inter- you're trying to do is reduce the amount of time um, that you're going to have over your bond. As you know, um, if your monthly bond, right, first couple of years does not reduce the principal loan, mm. what it does is it pays back the bank the interest that you've taken on by putting in an extra 50 rand all of these things are amortized, right? And mm. I advise you to utilize the amortization calculator on Uber again. Um, just click on amortization calculator. So what that does is every amount extra you pay goes against the interest, um, mm. not just against the, goes against the interest and the capital. So I definitely say it does depend. There's no right or wrong. It depends on what you are trying to achieve with it. If you have extra cash, because say the interest is 11% or whatever it is, is it also worth putting that extra cash in there? Because does that interest affect that money? Yeah, definitely. Again, no right or wrong answer. Eh? Or everything in property investing and property as a whole, there's, there's no right or wrong answer. If again, what you're trying to achieve is to pay down the debt quicker. Um, it's an amazing tool. There's, there's different things within the, the home loan sphere that makes things um, a lot more creative, like the access bonds that you can that you can always withdraw should you need um, and something does happen. If you do put it in your bond, what are you trying to achieve? Are you paying? That's what I was are you looking to, to yeah, pay bond. it down? Mm. Um, with access bonds, it's an amazing tool for you to almost have a, a kitty in your home loan that anytime you want, you can draw down from. So I, I definitely recommend it, mm. depending on what you're trying to achieve, of course. Uh, if if anyone's just tuned in, we are talking about property and how you can get onto that ladder, how best to invest with APSA. And um, another question, sorry, I, I, I meant to elaborate on the Jibril question about um, adding payment and the deposit because Jibril was saying, is, how do you, I guess the question here is, how do you work out what's better to buy a property or use that deposit to open a business that can generate extra income. I mean, how, I guess, how do you calculate the sort of income that you can make from your home property, your investment there? No, 100%. I think, number one, um, understand. So together at APSA, um, we partnered with an organization called TPN. So they give us um, rental data. So if you're going to enter an area, TPN will let you know what, what is the most reliable payer and what income brackets, how much money are they paying towards the said investment? Is it a two bedroom apartment? Is it a bachelor? And how much you can expect? Mm-hmm. And then it's up to you to understand, okay, so if you're charging 10,000 Rand rent for this specific property, if you buy at a million Rand, and this is before you even buy, Mm. If you buy at a million rand, what is your monthly bond? Understand your monthly, all of your monthly expenses, your monthly bond. So before you even buy, request the, the, the body corporate's um, monthly statement that gives you an idea on the levies, the special levies. Request municipal tax invoice that gives you an idea on how much your rates and taxes are, mm. how much you pay for sewers. Understand all the costs that comes with 
now that you own the property, all the monthly costs that you are liable to pay. Right, so then it's a simple exercise. You take the income you're earning minus all the expenses you're earning. And what does that give you? Is that a profit? Is it a loss? So that's how much you assess it on. And what's a good profit? I mean, if you're just making 50 rand, is it worth it? Good question. Again, um, depends on what you are investing for. Some people are investing for cash flow. So every single month they would like a return on their money. So um, you've put in 100,000 rand towards a deposit, towards your transfer costs, and then you got a bond. Um, and you want to return on that money. There's no right or wrong answer here. Um, in my opinion, as, lo as long as you are cash flowing positively. Some people have matrix. Um, I specifically go for at least 15% return on my money because if I'm going to take that same 100,000 rand and I'm going to put it in a savings account, yeah. how much can I get against it? Some, some money-making um, instruments, some government bonds, other investments will give me 5 6%. I want to make at least 15%. Mm. And some people are investing not for cash flow, right? Some people um, would like to one day make money. So they're happy to lose money. They're utilizing tax breaks and Section 13.6, um, where they're buying off plan properties. It's not really giving them monthly income. Mm. All they're looking for is tax benefits. So, again, depends on what you're trying to do. Mm. Well, you've got to be smart. You certainly got, got to get advice because there's, there's so many factors around this. Aren't there? Uh, we, we're going to. Be taking a short break now because we're going to be getting a, a news update and uh, what's happening on our roads. But when we come back after that, I want to ask you about investing in property, even when you don't have any money, what the tricks are, because you can. Exciting. That's very exciting. <laughs> So I'm speaking to Daniel Kazadi, Sapin Director, that's the South African Property Investor Network. We're talking about how to get onto that ladder. And uh, just before the, the news and that throw forward, I was asking you about how you can buy property if you don't have much money. Okay, so there's a different number of options and strategies, but I highly recommend you educate yourself on these thoroughly. You sit down with your, your team, your attorneys, and you go through it. So one of my favorites um, is governed by the Alienation of Land Act. I'm going to sound nerdy now. Um, the, governed by the Alienation of Land Act number 68 of 1981. So what, what it means is it's called the installment sale method. Mm -hmm. So you know how you can buy a house, a, a car via installments? Right? Yes. It's the exact same for property. And what this act allows you to do is you can do this without having the credit score, without having a good affordability. All you need to do is be educated enough to understand how this allows how does this solve the seller's issue and as well as your issue mm. so i'll give an example let's say there's a property i've just found and i do not have say the affordability or the cash to finance this what this act allows me to do is i can agree to pay the purchase price of this said property over a period of time. So it could mm. be um, two years, it could be five years. All you need to agree is the duration, the monthly installments. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, please go th through this with your attorney, is the attorneys request a title deed and then an endorsement is registered against the title deed. Mm. So then you are liable to pay the monthly expenses of the said property. You are allowed to, you, you, are, you need to pay the monthly installments to the seller then it's in turn your property transfer only takes place after you've paid off this property, mm -hmm. but it's a good way to control assets. Um, that's one option. Another way of investing in property, particularly if you do not have the finances, is things like rent to rent, right? So renting a property from uh, a landlord and getting permission in the lease agreement, you need to get permission to yes. sublet it to someone else. Those are some of the few creative ways you can go about it. Um, there's flips. Why would a landlord allow that to happen? Because wouldn't the landlord feel as though they're losing control then of their property, of the sort of people who might be entering their property? What's this, the, the, the first option or the second, installment sale or rent to rent? Rent to rent. Rent to rent. So um, it's different. So, so people that rent out their property, don't get me wrong, you're not going to find a landlord willing and just waiting for, for this to happen. There's going to be a lot of objections on their side. And it's up to you to to educate yourself on how to overcome this. I know particularly people that do rent to Airbnb. So they'll rent a property, then um, sublet on Airbnb. Mm. Um, some of the, the pain points we've seen landlords have and why they'll do this is number one, you are giving them the assurance that no matter what happens over a period of time, you are guaranteeing their rent, 
right? Yes. So um, what we normally do when we do this option, we offer more than 12 months leases. We'd offer an 18 month lease, lease, a lease to the landlord with more of, a, instead of a one month deposit, three months deposit. Mm. You can agree to do the maintenance. You can agree to pay the, ra okay. the rates and taxes. So before you do your all, you can provide more than a normal tenant is mm. where I'm alluding to. And believe me, and I say there'll be a lot of objections, but educate yourself. Don't, don't get me wrong. Landlords have every right to be against doing that. Sure. But if you can display that you have been in the business, you've got the proven track record, um, you can agree and go through all the different objections a landlord has. Mm. Believe me when I say there's a lot out there that would do it and you'd be surprised. Huh? Yeah, make, make it worth their while. 100% make it worth their while. So what if you... What if you buy a property and the neighborhood goes south, the neighborhood goes down? Jeez, yeah, I know, the amount of time. It's, it happened to me once, actually. I bought a property and uh, my, my neighbor got the rights to change the use of their property into a shabin, mm. Ooh. which was quite interesting. <laughs> it brought a um, different type of clientele and within six months, all my tenants gave letters to vacate. Really? Um, we bought mm. the property for about 900,000 and then only salvaged 600,000. Um, but in that property, we were overly capitalized. And I'll tell you what I mean right now. Mm. Like I said a bit earlier on, enter each investment with at least an, a, an exit strategy. And what do you mean by that? So 100%. So if you are entering and you're going to be renting out the, the properties, right? Mm -hmm. um, what most individuals don't do, um, like you put it out there, is constantly monitor the area the property is situated in. So like I mentioned TPN earlier on, there's, a, there's another company called Lightstone. So Lightstone gives you data on the average growth an area is experiencing. And it breaks it down on free holding property, sectional title, and vacant land. So before I even buy, I'll talk about before buying and what mm. to do now that you're already in there, the yep. mess, right? So before you even buy, go to Lightstone, put the address of the said area, and it tells you the type of properties. Like I said, freehold, um, sectional title, and vacant land. It gives me data on how much the property, how much properties are. Um, over a period of 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it gives you the average appreciation or depreciation of different investments. What the misconceptions people have is property always appreciates in value. Mm -hmm. That's totally wrong. You need to select the right area. And that's what Lightson will tell me is a three bedroom house. 10 years ago, how much was it? 10 years later, how much it is now. Oh, it works out for you, mm. the average growth that this, these assets have grown by. 10 years is quite um, a holistic view. It also limits it to the last two years. Right? Are these assets appreciating in value in, and or depreciating in value? So it keeps your finger on the pulse. Mm. Let's say I'm in an area, I put the address on light zone. I'm able to very quickly see, okay, uh, my property was worth a million rand now. Now it's only worth 800,000 rand. And then you can make an informed decision by walking around in the area. Is it still worth it holding this in the said area or should I start exiting? Right. So that's the sort of thing you need to start doing. And once you get experience in this, you do this even before buying the property. You know, if you're going to be renting it out, what happens if renting it out does not work? Is there another way I can make money from this investment? Can I sell it? Um, can I change strategies? So you've got a couple of options and more than anything, you are equipping yourself with enough knowledge to make informed decisions is what I'm trying to stress the importance of. Mm. Uh, we've got a voice note from Elroy. He brought a property. Let's hear what he's got to say about it. Hi, everyone. So I bought a property last year, right? Quite at a low value, about 330,000, about a 200 square meter space. My plan was to build the rental rooms in the yard, let's say, and the bank, when buying the property, the bank advised me that I got a future use amount that I can use, utilize after six months. So I saved a bit of money, put in planning that I would buy, I would use the future use amount with the money that I saved to build the rooms in the yard. However, the bank now advised that upon doing another evaluation on the property, there's no equity. But when they sold me the property, they never advised me that the future use would be available to any or subject to any conditions on what the property would look like. Would you be able to advise, perhaps? Thanks. Thanks, Elroy. It's Elroy, eh? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to try answer without being overly technical. Um, number one, Elroy, 
Okay, let me address number one, um, your question, and then a concern I do have outside of that. So 100%. So with banks, there's different forms of, say, valuations. Um, We're in quite a very opinionated industry where um, different individuals have different assessments on what market value is. So the bank have, has its own, estate agents have their own, investors have their own, homeowners have their own. I mean, you buy a property for a million, you spend 400,000 rand, you think that elevates your property to 1.4 million. As an industry, we come together and we utilize Lightstone and TPN. So Elroy, what you can do is you can contest any further valuations and what the bank feel the market value of your property is. If you feel it's more, you just need to support it. So again, go on Lightstone, type the address of the property, and it tells you, Elroy, Lightstone will give you a list of 20 of the most recent sales of similar properties to yours. So if yours is a three-bedroom house, 200 square meters, you just look through Lightstone, three-bedroom house, two-bedroom units, how much they've sold for in the last 12 months. And if you can support, so it gives you 20 of the most recent, and it does an average for you. If you can get all of that and you can go back to your banks and just support why you feel it's more. From my experience, when I've provided them data um, with apps, so we've come to great understanding. Um, to build rental units, Eloy, so my, my piece of advice, you can't just construct any single thing you want on the on any single property, right? So without being too, um, too technical, each and every single property um, has land use rights that the municipality provides us with, right? Mm. So it tells us how many, number one, dwellings or houses are you allowed in a certain in a certain yard, right? So there's different zonings, we call them. So res one, yeah. res two, res three. Elroy, I would educate myself on what, what sort of services have the municipality put into your property. Does it support? Because think about it. The city does this to control the to control the grid, right? Electricity, water, plumbing, roads. Now the city has allocated enough water and electricity for one family and maybe an extra. So it allows you to have an extra cottage. So now Elroy, for one family, you've now subdivided, you've added flats and you've, you're going to add eight families there. You're putting pressure on the grid and now there's going to be power failures on your site and everything. So I definitely recommend understanding, are you allowed to do that on your specific property? Can you get approved building plans? Because if you've got all of these families into the unit and something happens, God forbid, the building burns down and insurance goes out and they see you've not had building plans, you do not have the correct zoning, they will not cover you. So I definitely recommend consulting a town planner to understand what you're allowed to do. If you have all of those things, then definitely go for it, huh? All right, we're going to take a brief break and then we're going to carry on with our masterclass on property, how to get onto that ladder, how to buy property if you don't have much money, what you should be looking at if you want to uh, buy to let. Stay with us. Gosh, it's a topic we could cover for days, isn't it? It is, Um, yeah. I've I've got a couple of voice notes. Let's just listen to those. Hi, great show, guys. Uh, I just got a quick question. What happens if you rent out your property and the tenant defaults on rental. And obviously you cannot evict them, you have to follow the legal route and it can become quite costly. Are there any other ways of exercising this and trying to get rid of them in a quick and very cost effective manner? Thank you. I had um, a crash open behind me initially. It was a small crash with only a few children inside it and um, we didn't have any issues then a new um, um, person bought the crash and um, the noise levels went up quite significantly during the day um, it wasn't rezoned and no permits was um, obtained and i now need to speak to the new owner and um, he said that he is going to rezone the crash and um, it is cutting back on my enjoyment of my property. What is my rights as a homeowner? Thank you very much for sending those in, Daniel Kazadi. Okay, so the first one, eviction. I'll tell you, please, what not to do. Don't call the boys. Eh? You, you can't afford to call the boys. It is illegal to just take um, matters of the law into your own hands. Do, you're not allowed to disturb the enjoyment of use in any capacity of your tenants. Um, The eviction process, yes, is quite lengthy. 
Um, but what you need to understand is it protects the, the tenant sites, but also your rights as a landlord site, so definitely. My recommendation is follow the eviction process. Yes, I do understand the frustration it does bring. Um, the time during that period, there's no income being obtained. Um, there are measures you can take to ensure that before you place a tenant, they are the right tenants. Number one, I'd highly recommend vetting your tenants. So on TPN, um, you can do um, ID checks, verifications. What, what it also gives you the ability to do is you are able to see how this specific tenant applying for your unit has performed in other properties that they have rented out, provided that that landlord also utilized TPN. TPN gives you the data whether they paid the rent, whether they paid, if they did pay, did they pay on time? If not, did they do part payments? So that gives you a good indication. I'll do a credit and assessment value ver verification. So the rule of thumb is they should be at least earning three times the amount your rent is. So if they are earning 15,000, your rent is 5,000 and the rule in time, they should be earning. So three, request three months pay slips, three months bank statements. They sh if you're, you're charging 5,000 rand, let them at least earn 15,000 rand. And the fourth thing, get rental insurance, please. Eh? Um, what most people don't, understand, don't know is you can actually insure your tenants against non-payments. So a company, part of the SA Property Investors Network, Preferential, they do all the things a normal letting agent does. So they find you tenants, they vet the tenants, they go the step further where they provide rental guarantees. So if your tenants do not pay rent for up to four months, they continue paying you rent. They follow the eviction process, so they pay you rent during the eviction process and they find your new tenants. So I think um, definitely check them that's out. A, huh? That's a smart move. No, 100%. Huh? Especially because he has so many horror so stories. So many. Hey? And it can take years. 100%. And if you do it wrong, there's a student of mine that um, called the boys, as we like to put it. Um, and the rental tribunal was approached. And he has to house this tenant for two years for oh. free without pay, with a tenant no. paying rent. So please wow. be careful, follow the eviction process, but I can't stress the importance of doing it right from the start. Eh? Mm. Make sure you do it right and don't be too desperate. I, I, I do understand there's monthly bonds going off every single month and you might be inclined to just accept um, any single tenant, but f please make sure you vet the tenants. Don't be mm. too desperate. Eh? I'd rather have an empty unit than a troublesome tenant. Eh? So that's with regards to the first question. The second question is with regards to the crash. Um, that um, the gentleman did, did put out. Um, what you need to understand is in the in the zoning process, there'll, be, there'll come a time where um, the town planners and the said owner has to advertise to the community and the community can lodge any single disapproval to any single thing. So um, part of the zoning process is number one, this owner will have to approach council to see if roads, electricity and water can accept their applications. Mm. Should should the municipality give them the inclination that they would accept it, then the community can contest and object because um, it will be advertised in that entire area. They will receive mail to see if they support it. They as a community can come together against it if they do not support it. Huh? Um, if, if somebody wants to find out more, I mean, how do they get in touch with you? Can you remind us what those um, websites are that we need to get on to, uh, the TPN, etc.? Uh, 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 remind us what those are, please. No, 100%. So um, we are the SA Property Investors Network. So you can go on the website and just type sapropertynetwork.com. Um, so we, like I said, we are a community of Every single thing you need, one-stop shop, you need for every single thing, you, every single service provider you need in your property investment journey. From the financing, our biggest partner being APSA Bank, um, we do a lot of these engagements and workshops, educating individuals. TPN is also a partner of ours. Um, so I definitely recommend coming to SAPIN. We are also on socials. I'm also on social. So on Instagram, Dan, Kaz Dan Kazadi Real Estate as well. So um, SA Property Investors Network on the website is the, the place you can go, yes. And this has been recorded, so you can watch it as many times as you want. Daniel Kazadi, SAPN Director, South Africa Property Investor Network. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me, Jane. And thank you for tuning in to the 702 Masterclass with Rele Bukhile Moboja, brought to you by APSA Home Loans. Come back every first and last Wednesday of the month for more conversations with property industry experts, guiding you to the next chapter of your home ownership story, wherever you find yourself on the journey. Congratulations 
to Refilwe Agnes Leso and Bocanyo Tamai. You've won 5,000 rand for sharing your home ownership story. Go to the 702 Facebook and X pages for a chance to be the next winner. Absa Home Loans is committed to housing the nation, one home ownership story at a time. Your story matters. Absa T and C supplies. Absa is an authorized financial services and registered credit provider. NCR CP7. Congratulations to both of you.